Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's episode of how to build a compiler with LLVM and MLIR, we're going to talk about the semantic analyzer. Before we start, uh, I received a couple of questions regarding to the previous episode that I need to answer. So let's just start by them and then uh, move to the main topic. The first question I got was, why didn't we implement a linked list? So if you remember from the previous episode, the implementation that we have for a list contains a vector, like it's a wrapper around a CD vector. So um, since we're going to, uh, since our goal is to actually create a really simple compiler to begin with and build on top of that, we do at this stage, we really don't have to uh, create a, like a actual linked list. So I chose to use uh, just a wrapper around the uh, vector type, but the, like the right answer is in the near future, we have to kind of make a li uh, linked list, but not a linked list in C++. So we have like, when we this uh, when we get to the type system, I I di I it didn't uh, decide on the type system details and like anything around that yet. I'm still uh, in a study phase, but when we get to that phase to actually implement a uh, type system, we need to create a proper list type. That list type has to be in in the uh, MLIR type. So uh, it would be different. It would be different than a linked list in C++. But for now, since the AST has to represent the syntax syntactic structure of our source code and not the semantic structure, you, you know what I mean, right? Uh, we really don't care about the implementation of the list. It can be anything as long as it uh, has some collection attributes. Um, but in the near future, we definitely have to implement a list. The second question I got was, why are we using the STD vector instead of LLVM collections? Um, if you read the programming manual of LLVM, and the LLVM provides like many different uh, alternative types to the well-known uh, STD types, like for vectors, LLVM has a small vector, dense vector, or some other types of, even like a string vector, if I'm not mistaken, and different alternative for a string types, for maps, for popular data structures, right? The reason LLVM uh, provide their own implementation is that they're basically they don't they want to be they want to have a data structure that suits their needs uh in most cases the data the alternative data structures are faster and more efficient uh so they highly recommend to you uh, recommend everyone to use them and frankly we have to do it as well we we uh, we've done it in some places, but in the near near future, when we get to the phase that we start to refactor the code, we have to replace the vectors with uh, like a proper uh, alternative. But for now, since uh, I don't, I I try to avoid any confusion, any point of uh, confusion in the source code. Uh, I I decided to stick with the vector type or other well-known types that everyone who um, uses C++ might know about. And like, there's tons of information about this uh, standard libraries around. But for the LLVM stuff, you have to dig into the source code and read some uh, pieces in the LLVM programming uh, programmer's manual. So I think it's easier and simpler to understand for now. But uh, in the future, we obviously we're going to move away from vectors and uh, use the alternative types. Okay. Uh, now it's time to actually uh, talk about the main topic of today, which is the semantic analyzer. So 
in in the previous episodes uh we talk, uh, we have talked about the reader and the ast of serene and in today's episode we're going to move to the next phase which is the semantic analysis again as usual i expect you to uh, know about the semantic analysis uh, the semantic analysis and uh, the different uh, concepts around it uh, in the in in both of the compilers books that i uh, introduced to you in previous episodes there's plenty of information about semantic analysis but just in case just to uh, be true to our uh, kind of tradition of going through a very basic overview of the topic. Let's talk about what is the semantic analysis. So we have talked about the ASD and how it represents the syntactic form of uh, the source code, but we never talked about what if the syntax what if we have a code that the syntax is sound, but semantically it's meaningless, right? So the semantic analysis job is to make sure that the sem our program is semantically correct. For example, uh, in a Lisp, uh, as you can see in the code example that I, I uh, wrote here, Having a list like this is told, like syntax it is syntactically correct. So the first element is number four, and the second element is a symbol of uh, symbol called main. So there's nothing wrong with it syntactically, but semantically it doesn't make sense. How to call a function called four? How do you call a function? Oh, sorry. How do you call a number? That's uh, like catching these type of uh, semantics er semantic errors is the job for the semantic analyzer. Traditionally, uh, the type checker and other types of checks that you might need to do uh, on your source code comes in the same, like applies in the same phase, right? So to wrap it up, Basically, the semantic analysis phase is a phase that we look into the source code, look into the ASD that we have, and try to make sense of it. We want to check whether it, according to our language specification, does it make sense? Is it correct? Is like is it going to work? Basically, so um, you in in the uh, in the diagram that you on the screen basically uh, the ASD will look like this we have a list with two elements the first element is a number and the second one is a symbol the ASD itself it's kind of correct there's nothing wrong with it right this is actually the correct representation of the source code that we have it uh, we have in here so the reader has nothing to complain about and the AST is fine, but it doesn't make sense according to a, to the Lisp specification, right? Traditionally in semantic analysis phase, um, it different compilers actually look for like semantic errors and try to uh, make sure that the the AST is well formed and semantic of the language is fine, right? But in our compiler, in in Serene's compiler, we have some other steps in the semantic analysis phase, which is the rewrites. So, um, if you remember, up until now, we have only few. AST nodes like lists, symbols, and numbers, and nothing else, right? From the previous episode. But let's have a look at the exact, uh, the same exact uh, example that we had from the previous episode. We define a function. We call it main, basically to be more precise. We create an uh, create an anonymous function. Then 
we bind the symbol main to that function so it's kind of like defining a function called main and then we call a function called prn and main at the same time to print the output of the main function right okay i made a mistake here but uh, it's fine for now so in the diagram that is uh, that my cursor is on right now you can see the uh, the ASD that represent the syntax. We talked about it in the pre previous episode. Uh, it's just the syntactic representation of the source code above. But when we run the same ASD through the semantic analysis, uh, semantic analyzer, sorry, we're going to get uh, the blue diagram, right? What happens is we walk through the AST tree node by node and then try to uh, find a specific patterns, right? For example, a list with a symbol def as the first argument, as the first element, sorry, is a pattern. It means we, we want to define a new binding in our, lang in our uh, program, right? So when we hit such a, when we see such a pattern, we rewrite that pattern to use a different node instead of the list node, right? So this list node in here will be rewritten into a def node. We, we're going to, I'm going to show you the def node and other types of AST nodes that we have uh, for the semantic analysis phase. We have like three more and def is one of them. So we remove the entire tree, entire node, sorry, with uh, with its children and replace it with a def node. The def itself contains a symbol to the, uh, obviously the name of the binding and a value, which in this case is an uh, anonymous function, right? It might be a different thing. It might be a, not be a, like a function. It might be a number, whatever, right? By the way, when we reach to this, when the semantic analyzer reached this point, basically to this list in here, it looks for another pattern, right? This list ma matches another pattern. And that pattern is of anonymous function. When a list starts with a symbol called FN, we're trying to uh, define a function, right? So it rewrites this uh, tree and replace it with a node called fn that i didn't uh, i didn't put the um, the uh, extra details in here but for now it's fine and obviously on the second line which is represented by the tree on the right we have a list that starts with a symbol uh, prn as the first element and another list which is a function called on main uh, i made a mistake in this diagram so i'm going to just fix it in uh, fix it live. Um, actually, if I do this, then the, this diagram on the right would not be correct. But whatever, like uh, it's a temporary fix. Yeah, and I'm going to explain what's wrong here. So the tree on the right is the is a smaller tree with a new node on top as a root as the root which is called call <laughs> funny um the call node itself represents a function call a call site or a function call right what happens in here is that we looked for a pattern which is the most common pattern for a list a, we like basically anything any expression in lisp evaluates to something right numbers evaluate to themselves strings the same symbols evaluate to the value there uh, that the name is bind to bind to and uh, lists evaluate to a function call right so the in a lisp when you see a list like this 
basically the first element has to be a function and that list implementation is going to find that function and call that function by passing the rest of the list as the elements to that uh, as the arguments to that function so it's a common pattern as soon as we see su such, uh, such a pattern we rewrite that tree with a call node so basically this uh, new node is uh, kind of represents a function call and i'm going to show you the node again but it has a target uh, right now it has a, like a what we are trying to call the first element is a symbol so we have to do something about that symbol what happens is we look into the scope that we we are in and we try to resolve the symbol prn to a value and that we, value has to be a function or has to be a callable uh, entity right and a list of uh, argument so the, mis the mistake i made in this diagram is that previously it was like this right so we had two functions call function calls but uh, i just created one function call here so the right diagram for the for this syntax in here would be a call function in here and instead of this list it would be another call that would be calling the main function right but um I may uh, maybe I, I'm going to fix that in the future. I, I don't know. But for now, uh, you can see that how the semantic analyzer will rewrite the common patterns to use different node types. Why why are we doing this? The to put it simply is that later on, when we want to generate the SLIR based on the AST, it's easier to actually. Uh, map the uh, different node types to different SLIR operations rather than trying to be clever and find the patterns there. Beside that, uh, in this phase, we should actually check for the types to match and run the type checker here as well. And by doing that, we need more information on the node types and what are what we're doing here. Let us to like give us more insight into the tree and into the syntax. Basically, um, it makes our life uh, much easier to uh, much easier in the, to run the type che uh, type checks and stuff like that on the AST um okay and uh, let me show you how the semantic analyzer works and how you can actually interact uh oops interact with it in the you know, with the compiler itself so as you can see i already compiled the source code and i already ran this one as well so um I added some stuff to the to to the compiler uh, after the previous episode, but uh, we're going to talk about them in the future. It's not, uh, they're not important at the moment, like the build directory and stuff like that. But for now, um, we have an emit action called semantic. If you remember, for the AST stuff, we had the AST action that basically prints out the uh, raw AST and now there's another action called semantic there's a bunch of actions which we didn't talk about uh, about most of them but for now AST and semantic are all uh, you need so what happens in here is that we pass a new for the source file hello world.srn we ask the compiler to uh, print out the AST after the semantic anal uh, analyzer phase. Uh, this dash O is just the output that doesn't apply to uh, semantic action. And finally, build directory is obvious. Where do you want me to build the uh, build the source code? Again, it doesn't apply to the semantic uh, action. So. 
here you see the raw uh, AST and here is the AST after semantic analysis phase. As you can see, oh, by the way, let me show you the source code as well. Was it in docs? No. Yeah. Mm. This is the uh, source code we're trying to work on, like quite simple and dumb, right? As you can see here, um, we have a list with a symbol def as the first element. That's a pattern. Symbol main as the second one, which is the binding, the name of the binding, and another list that represent a function call, uh, sorry, anonymous function as the third element. So there's two patterns in here. One is for a function and the second one is for a binding. Oh, by the way, I said fn first and def second, right? So the rules is when we walk a tree, we always start from uh, the inner node, right? So we get to the uh, leaf of the tree and then we find our way back to the root. That's why Fn would be first all the time. So as you can see, when we rewrite the entire tree, the result would be a def node that we're going to talk about shortly from main to another node that that node is itself is a Fn node, a new type of node that I'm going to show you. So we rewrote the uh, re, uh, entire list here to a def node. And similarly, we have another def here that is kind of the uh, represent the second line. So as you can see, we have re, uh, AST rewrite in place. Now the AST is much simpler and kind of obvious. Instead of a bunch of nested list, uh, lists, we have two def, no uh, def nodes, two nodes, that's it. It makes uh, reasoning about the AST much easier and simpler. Okay, let's go back to... Okay, it's time to uh, talk about the code itself. To begin with, I need to show you the code, uh, like the entry point of the semantic analyzer. So in the include directory, they're in and in the reader package. So a semantic analyzer is part of the uh, reader namespace. It might change in the future, but for now it's fine. Okay, as you can see, uh, the entry point is quite simple. We have a type that call, it's like a, um, what do you call it? Type def, right? We have a type def, which is called uh, analyzed result. It's, a, it's just analyzed for re, a result type that the success case is, uh, is an AST and the failure case is a vector of er error pointers, right? We talked about the result type uh, quite a lot in previous episodes. Uh, if you don't know what uh, how it works, uh, check out the previous episode, right? So the main entry point is a function called analyze. It takes two arguments. The first one is a reference to a setting context that I'm going to talk, uh, talk about it in the next episode. And the second argument is a tree, is, a, uh, is an AST tree, right? What it returns is the analyze result, that type of that we just uh, talked about, right? Let's look at the uh, implementation. Okay, the implementation itself is uh, quite simple. Uh, don't uh, um, like don't be bothered by the to do. Like we have tons of to dos in the source code. Uh, if you're interested, you can actually uh, 
fix them and send patch to uh, some send some patches to me uh, by the way i'm right now i'm working on the just in time compiler so this to do actually you can't actually fix this to do here because the jit is not ready yet but uh, maybe in the future right so what happens in in the semantic analyzer is that we walk the tree node by node and then as you can see here basically we walk the tree node by node if you remember uh, from the previous episode the ast data structure itself is analyzed for a vector of nodes so ast here is actually a vector right so when we say uh in, like in this for loop basically each element would be a root of a tree right um oops so we walk the tree node by node and we call the uh, analyze function on the root node, right? So again, from the previous episode, we know that each element, each uh, expression, each type of expression has to have a analyze function. It's part of the expression interface. So by calling it, we might get a node back. That may be node, as you can see on the top right of the of my screen, that maybe node is a type analyze for a result that the success case is a node and the failure case is a vector of error pointers, right? So here's the rules for our semantic analyzer. A disclaimer, I, uh, I have to have a disclaimer here. The design that's... Uh, I have here is not perfect. It's, it's actually uh, kind of, uh, I don't know what to say, like um, unpleasant because we use null pointers um, and I don't like it. But again, since we want to have our um, minimal version of the compiler ready as soon as possible, let's go with it. Uh, we might re replace it in the future with a, like a more sophisticated uh, version and avoid using null pointers. But for now, it's fine. That was the disclaimer, right? So when we get back a maybe node, that maybe node has three states. It it's either is a success case. So a maybe node being success, um, the success success case of a maybe node means the return value has a node in it, right? So we get the value, by getting the value, we get back a node. So again, if you remember, node is a shared pointer to a expression type. And that expression can be a symbol, can be a list, can be anything, anything that implements the expression interface. Uh, if you don't remember about the expression and how it, uh, its interface works, sorry. If you don't remember about the expression, check out the previous episode on the AST. If the, if the, so if the node that we got back wasn't a null pointer, since the node itself is a shared pointer, it, it can be a null pointer as well. So if there was a node, we just push it back to AST. So a, we define the like an empty AST here. And by doing this, we put the node, the new node that we got into the uh, new AST that we're going to return it later. But if the no, if the return value, if the node that we expect uh, we got back from the maybe node was actually a null pointer, it implies that we don't want to rewrite, right? So basically, the the if uh, kind of like. This if that we have here, the success branch is a rewrite and the failure branch is not a rewrite. It, it means that, okay, we don't want to rewrite this node, put it back, it's grand. But if the maybe node actually didn't contain any success uh, value and it contain a, a failure value, right? Failure case. It means that there was some semantic errors in the AST. 
So what happens is we get the error, we put it in the error stack and move on. Uh, at this point, we don't have uh, like a proper implementation of like er error hand like error system and er error handling at the moment. That's the next thing I'm going to do after the just in time compiler. We have some pieces in place, like we have some uh, trade and error implementation, some uh, a way to actually uh, mark errors and differentiate them. But I need to be more precise and provide more utilities around errors. Uh, but uh, for now, it's fine. So to kind of uh, go over the whole uh, algorithm one more time. We call the analyze function on each expression on each node of the AST. If it returns a success case and that success case contain the node, it means that we want to actually rewrite the current node with the new node that we got from the analyze function. So we put it in the AST and by doing this, basically we're replacing the current element. But if it was a success case with a null pointer, it means that we don't want to rewrite and the current element is good enough. So we just put the current element of the current uh, AST tree into the uh, result, right? Not result, sorry, into the new AST tree that we want to return. And if the maybe node, if the return value of the analyze function contained a, a failure case, it means that there was a semantic error. We need to get the error, put it back into the uh, error stack and move on. And finally, we check the error stack. If it was empty, there is no error. So return a success case and return the new generated AST, right? Best case. And if it wasn't empty, we have some errors. Return a failure case with the error stack. It's really simple. The, the only tricky part is that null pointer here and to make it better in the future we need to actually re replace the the uh, null point uh, null pointer with pr probably with a new type of expression um i didn't think of it yet but using a null pointer is kind of icky to me um if you're interested in this please feel free to work on it fix it and uh send me a patch i I would be really glad. Moving on. Um, so from the previous episode, we talked about the expression. Where is it? Yeah, we we have talked about the expression uh, class, which is the kind of the interface for every uh, expression and AST nodes that we have in Serene. As you can see, all the expressions has to have, has to implement the analyze function. We talked about it. In the previous episode, we talked about symbol, number, and list. Let's look at the, oops, sorry. Let's look at the symbol to see how did we actually implement, uh, implemented the analyze function. As you can see, we just return a success case with the null pointer. So that means based on the uh, rules that we saw just earlier, that means we never rewrite a symbol. A symbol is when we want to analyze it, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't get rewrite. Uh, it doesn't get rewritten to anything else. The same thing applies to, uh, what was it? numbers in case of a number again a number node would would be itself we don't rewrite it to anything else but that's not the case for the list okay it's a bit uh, long as well so 
what we're going to do uh, in case of a list. First of all, we make sure that the list is not empty. If the list is not empty, get the first element. Since the you know elements itself is like a pro attribute of the list class, it's a vector. So we're calling we we are getting the first element, and since it's a shared pointer, we want to have access to the value itself, not the pointer. So first would be a pointer to that value, and then we check the type. So here we, we are actually looking for the patterns. If the type of the first element was, uh, if the first, uh, sorry, if the type of the first element is a symbol, we try to dynamically cast it to a symbol. We talked about the LLVM dynamic cast in the previous episode and how it works. Uh, I hope you had a look at the um, pro LLVM's programmer manuals to read more about dynamic casting and how LLVM does it. But basically what happens here is that if uh, the variable first is actually a symbol, the sim pointer would be a pointer to a symbol. Otherwise, if it's not a symbol, it's going to be null. So we check for it, whether it, if it's null or not. If it's not null, then we check the name. So if the name of the first element was def, so we have a pattern, right? We call def, we call the make, fun, uh, make a static function on the def class. We're going to look at it. Uh, uh, soon if it was fn we do the same but this time for the fn uh, class def and fn both are uh, new like an um, expression type i didn't mention them in the previous episode because they belong here but basically they're the same as list symbol number and other expression types they're just another node in our ast tree but they have this make a static function that makes it easier to create a new uh, function, new, sorry, new instance of uh, that type of node. So here's another to do. I didn't mention it here, but probably I have it in the dev.org file. Um, we need to make sure that we have this, uh, like we have an interface for this behavior, either this, or create a new function like the make function uh, from earlier in the expression file to have a unified interface to create uh, these type of nodes. But right now it's a bit uh, kind of sparse. I don't like it, but for now it's okay. Again, feel free to fix it and send me a patch. And finally, if uh, it was nil, if this uh, if it wasn't a symbol which we already tested it it should be a symbol but anyway if the first element uh, wasn't a symbol we're going to create a new uh, sorry my bad I'm I'm getting uh, out of my head so if we couldn't find any pattern but the first element was a still is a still a symbol. What we're going to do is to create a new uh, node call, like a new call node. Basically, we, the first element is not a, spe a special form. Special form is the concept of Lisp. Look it up in uh, like Google it. So fn and def both are special forms. So if we did if we couldn't find a pattern and the first element wasn't a special form it must be a function call so we create the function call uh, node here by using the call expression um, and return it and if the finally if the uh, list was empty just return an empty node what is an empty node empty node is just maybe node success now so basically what we can do in here instead of having this we can oops sorry uh, keyboard uh, macros doesn't work sometimes 
um we can do empty no right it would be exactly the same i hate it when i uh increase the font size and the warnings uh like interrupt my work and also the same applies to what was the other one symbol yeah so we can go here. oops 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 can go here and say anti no, number two done right so they're the same they're uh, equivalent of each other so now we know how do we actually uh, find the patterns for a list but let's have a look at the Dave def expression as you can see, it's an, a def itself is another expression. So it implements the expression uh, interface or to be uh, precise, it uh, inherits from the expression abstract class. It has a binding that is the name of the binding we're going to create or to put it uh, better, the binding itself is the name of the binding we represent and the value is just a node so it can be any type of node it, it doesn't have to be a function but it can be anything right as long as it's a expression it's fine for us it has uh, like a normal constructor nothing special here the only thing you, you need to know uh, we talked about the location range that's fine and here is the new maybe a new concept i can't remember that we talked about a string ref maybe in the previous episode i don't know but uh it's just a reference type from uh the llvm one of those alternative types that is better for us to use so we've used uh, I, I used it here and finally a reference to a node that uh, we want to represent in our binding the rest is just the same as before. We talked about uh, get type and to a string. We're going to take a look at the analyze uh, right now and the generate IR. Uh, we're going to talk about it in the future. Class of again, it's for the dynamic casting and static uh, statically casting of the LLVM. We talked about it, and here's that make a static function that I was talking about earlier. So. Basically, we just use the, this make function in any expression that we have only in the uh, semantic analysis phase. But it's fine for, the, you know, it's fine, but it, it we can make it better. There, like if someone else comes in today and want to create a new expression type, since it's not part of the interface, uh, that new person might not know about it creating this make function so it's easy to miss at the same time it's optional but it's better to have a, a, like a, a structure and kind of a, a rule for this type of stuff okay so let's move uh, to the implementation of def where is it here okay as you can see the the expression type itself is a def, obviously. To a string is kind of simple. It says um, a def node from the binding to the value. So we call the to a string of the value here as well. But for the analyze phase, that uh, is the topic of today. As you can see, again, we return an empty node here. Let me actually fix, not fix it. It was correct. Just make it more precise, empty node. Okay. So when we reach, to, uh, reach a def node in our AST while we're looping uh, through the elements of the AST, we don't do anything with it. We don't want to rewrite a def node. And obviously, if we get the result uh, from, if we get the AST from the reader, 
we shouldn't really run into a diff node because reader doesn't understand the semantic of the language. So it's unlikely to happen, but since we want to satisfy the interface of expressions, we have to have analyze function and it has to return an empty node. Um, you know the rest. The, um, the most important part here is this make function. What is the serine context? We talk about it in the uh, next episode, but uh, the second argument is a list. So if we go back to the list implementation, as you can see, when we call the make function, we pass it the, sin uh, the context and a pointer to the current list. This is a pointer to the uh, object, right? So it would be a pointer to the list. What happens in here uh, when we want to create this def uh, node, we need to create it, like create an actual def node, right? So we need to run some checks. The first uh, check here is to make sure uh, that the uh, number of arguments is not three. Actually, um, we need to change this here. This should be something like, uh, Oops, something like this. Drives me crazy when it jumps, uh, but you know, I need to increase the font size anyway. Okay, so a def in a lisp works like this and it should be a list with def name of the binding and value right in the future in the future we might have a docker string here as well but for now we, we don't so we don't want to uh, check for that so it it should always have three um, elements the list has to have three elements Ooh, you know what? I was right in the first place. Uh, so it has, it should have three elements. If it, if the number of elements wasn't three, isn't three, return a failure case with a nice message. The message is like, we expect three, uh, three arguments for a, a def special form, but like you provided this many, and we create a node an errorful node we talked about uh, about make errorful in the previous episode uh, basically what it does is to point to the location of the error and we have a new error called the wrong number of arguments we i'm going to talk about the errors as well in the next episode but basically it's just a class of a, a subtype of errors right with a message that we provided to it so if the number of arguments to the to def wasn't three, we are going to return an error. And if you remember from the root analyze function, returning an errorful value result in failing the analysis phase. And we, we're going to put this error in a st error stack and return it to uh, whatever that is calling the analyze function to handle. But if we had exactly three elements, we're going to get the first element dynamically cast it to the to a symbol. Obviously, this def symbol has to be a uh, if it's a symbol, it's going to be a pointer to a symbol. Otherwise, it's going to be null. So which ooh, so we check the def here. I wish, let me just write a to do here really quick. Replace this one with a uh, one time, oops, one time check. Okay, so we make sure that uh, def is not null and the name is def, right? But I, I, I don't want to use other because it's going to go away in a release uh, build. So we need to replace it with the runtime check to make sure that this never happens. Because like who knows 
we might call may this make fun function from some other places so we have to make sure that it doesn't happen and as there would be only a debug mode like it's a debug mode only so it won't uh, check the entire thing in release mode okay when we made sure that def sim is actually a symbol and the name is def then we have to look for the binding so the binding is the second element we get the pointer try to dynamic oh god try to dynamically cast it to a symbol and if it was a symbol if it wasn't a symbol return a new error a uh, new type of error which is called def expect symbol and the message is empty because like uh, it's obvious it, like this error type already has a message uh, inside of it we don't need a, like extra message so we're going to fail the semantic analysis phase with this uh, error type oh by the way if you remember uh, from earlier even if we return an error it doesn't mean we're going to stop the loop we we're going to walk the entire tree and find all the all the error messages but obviously some of the error messages it's like an, an error message like this if if we fail to uh, create a def it means like they're not going to be a binding uh, that we expect so later on when in some other places when we want to use that binding uh, for example in a function call since the binding is not there then we're going to generate another error so it would be like a butterfly effect when we fail the uh, semantic analysis here then it causes some other uh, issues down the line but the plan is to actually connect these error types together so stack them on top of each other so you can see from like when you see the first error you can understand what caused that error there's another error and you can visually iterate through the errors to get to the uh, fair, very first error that caused the whole uh, whole um, armageddon in your uh, program so if the binding uh, was actually a symbol then we uh, get, try to get the value here we call the analyze function on the value itself so we want the value to be analyzed as well right when we do this the value that we get like the value here is actually a maybe value as you can see it's a maybe node so it might the same rule of uh, semantic analysis works here as well and then we do kind of the same thing again i don't like this logic in here because if we ch change the semantic analysis logic in the future for example uh, the one with the null pointer then we have to remember that okay we have the same logic somewhere else so we need to fix fix it as well so the better thing to do here sorry is to refactor uh, this logic into a generic uh, right so the better thing to do here is to actually provide a generic function that uh, gives us the same kind of behavior and use it here so by when we want to change the behavior we just change it in one place and it reflects on uh, the entire source code but anyway so if the value if uh, if when we analyze the the second element which is the value if it was a success case and it has a new node it means that we need to rewrite the value so we set the analyzed value to the new node otherwise we set it to the current element current second element obviously if it was a null pointer we want don't want the rewrite right otherwise we return the error and finally, here's a bit of a, uh, it's a crazy thing to do, but I'm going to describe uh, like my you know, chain of thoughts basically about this piece. So we check for the type of the second element, the, the one after uh, 
the semantic analysis. So we semantically analyze the second element, which is the value. If it was a function, then we we cast it to the function type. Again, it if it was a nil, you know this thing, as you can see, it shouldn't it should never happens. But in order to keep the linter happy, we have uh, like I had to put it here. LLVM unreachable is just an, uh, like a function that raises an exception if we ever reach to this point, which we shouldn't really. So to make the linter happy, I had to include this uh, condition in here. So when we cast the uh, second element, the value into a pointer of function, then I set the name. So the function expression has a uh, member function called set name, and we pass the binding name to it. The reason I'm doing this, if you look into other type of list, like closure, for example, there's a function called, uh, I don't remember whether it's, it's a function or a macro, but there's a there's something called def n, which you can actually, in, in, I'm talking about closure right now. You can actually create a function like this, right? So it, it would create a new binding to a function with the name, let's, let's use a better name, A, B, C, right? Oh, by the way, if you see me typing uh, really weird, I, I'm using a new uh, keyboard layout called Halmec or something like that, that is, awesome it's it's perfect and i'm not used to it uh, that much yet so i make so many mistakes uh, check it out it's it's really good i'm going to uh, put a link to it in the description uh anyway uh so in closure we have a macro like this right in order to do this in serene first of all we need to have something like this right a b c Mm, yeah, Fn and blah, 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 right? But when we translate the syntax into an AST, this function here doesn't know about a ABC at all. So if something bad happens in this function and we want to fail somehow, show, an, show like a stack trace or whatever, this function itself doesn't know about ABC. What should we do? That's uh one of the things that we do in the semantic analyzer right when we made sure that this function is fine semantically correct and we we detect the diff pattern then we just as you can see here set the name of this anonymous function that i'm going like the next thing that we're going to talk is the function node you get to see the set name as well so it might look uh it might look a little bit strange but uh here's the reason okay and finally ooh, a good part we're not going to talk about the context here and like name spaces or semantic environment blah 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 now i'm going to talk about it uh, in the next episode but basically what we're doing in this um uh, in this line here, we create a new binding in our current scope. That's it. That's all you need to know. We create a new binding in our current scope, that car the current scope of the current namespace. What is a namespace? What is a scope? Wait for the next episode. And finally, if, the, if we successfully created that binding, we return a successful node called def, with the location of the list, uh, the list being the uh, current list that def is in, like is the first element. So it makes sense to use the same location. With the binding name, oh, oh come on. With the binding name, name and the analyzer value. Otherwise, there should be an error. We shouldn't get here. So to make the uh, linter happy, we use a little bit more reachable here. Okay. Moving on, I guess it's uh, it's a long episode. So, um, second, no, uh, sorry. 
the next one is oops and h again fn.h is like quite simple it has a name a list of arguments and an ast of body right so body itself is a, a vector of expressions arguments uh, are a, a list we have a to do here that says instead of using a list use a collection here we don't have a collection yet we, we're going to have a collection in the future uh, that is going to be a, a family of types right so list would be a collection vector would be a collection map would be a collection so we should be able to use any of that instead of list here and um, they would have different meanings especially map moving on uh, the rest is quite simple like the stuff that we had for uh, def and other expression there's another uh, member function called set name that we saw earlier we get on a string and set set the name uh, to that string going to the implement oh sorry it's a wrong <laughs> wrong project um and yes okay so i'm not going to talk about the uh, obvious stuff you can read about uh, read about them uh, yourself they're quite similar to the other expression that we talked about but the make function is really important to us here's the to do right now our functions doesn't support doc strings but in the future we want to support doc strings so when we introduce doc strings into our uh, function we need to expect more elements not just three so we check for the number of uh, arguments uh, a function needs at least two uh, arguments the name of the function and the list of various arguments sorry if the number of arguments were, were is sorry less than two then return a new error type so fail the semantic analysis again with with that error otherwise let's like create uh, let's get the first element dynamically cast it to a symbol so fn sim has to be a symbol and if it wasn't a symbol it, it will be nil uh, sorry null and same thing here again we need to replace uh, this check with a uh, runtime check here is the to do and then cast the arguments sorry the reason that it happens is that i have one of those fancy mechanical keyboards and i have some macro on some specific keys when i like sometimes when i uh, move really fast the macro can't catch up and that happens <laughs> anyway um so we get the second uh, argument se second element of the list again this list here is the input list to the make function and it comes from here so it would be a pointer to the current list that fn is the first element of it so we get the second uh, element that the second element has to be a, a list of arguments right if if there wasn't a list of argument we return an error full case a failure case sorry with a new type of error that says fn args must be a list uh, i'm going to talk about uh, the different types of error in the next episode and up until here it's it was fine from here it gets a little bit different so we define a new ast which is an is an empty vector an empty uh, ast then if we had a third or more we had more than two elements it means that we have a body we create a new body if you remember uh, body was just a vector of nodes right so since it's a vector we can create a vector out of another vector like this 
it means okay create a vector from this third element and till the end of the current vector and name it body right and put it in the body variable then we call the analyze function on that body so if you uh you can see that we call the actual analyze uh, function the entry point to the analyze uh, analysis phase to the semantic analysis phase right since the body itself is just another ast so we can use the same function here nothing prevents us from doing that uh we need to the same we need to do the same thing in the def expression where i put that new to do right so we get back a maybe ast if there wasn't an ast so th there's some type of errors just create a new failure case return the error types hmm you know what uh, uh we can actually it's redundant here we can just say maybe ast because they're the same they should be the same type right oh no 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 sorry my bad my bad uh, make actually has to return a node but uh, semantic analysis returns a maybe ast so what we do, we're doing here is to get the error from maybe asd and then um, return it as a node here the error here might be like a it's a stack of error it, it might be one two three whatever and if the if the maybe asd has the had a success case then we get the value and put it in the body so the new value of body when we get to here is actually a new asd that is semantically correct and we run the semantic uh, analyze, analyzer on it so it should be fine so finally by this point we have the uh, location we have the args and we have a semantically correct body so we can create actually a new function node and return it done that was the function um, node and finally let's uh, talk about the final piece of the puzzle call so at this point when we talk about the uh, no 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 let's let's talk about the call first so again call is another expression it has a target node and a list of uh, uh, an ast of params the target node can be any expression right so the target node can be number the target node can be a symbol can be function can be def whatever since it's a node and the params sorry that is a uh, that is an ast is a vector of nodes right we could have write uh, sorry um we could have write like vector of no like basically be literal and say vector a uh, vector of nodes here but obviously ast is just smaller and uh, easier to understand again the constructor is not a big deal nothing special just initializes the uh, object same set of uh, function member functions as the other expressions so let's move to the actual implementation that is important to us again i'm not going to talk about the obvious stuff get type to a string and things like that but in the analyze phase like the other uh expressions like fn and other stuff we just return empty node because we don't want to rewrite the call node and again when we get the ast from the reader it shouldn't contain any call node so basically it doesn't happen it shouldn't happen it's just for uh, making the interface happy. But the uh, make a static function, it comes from here. So in case that we couldn't find any special form pattern, we suppose that it's a call, uh, it's a function call, so we create a call node. 
So first of all, we don't, again, we need to replace the hazard with a, like a runtime check. But what happens in, in here is that calling an empty, like empty list doesn't make sense here. How do you want to call a call an empty list with no target? So it doesn't make sense. We just have to make sure that we have one, at least one element in our list that is uh, the function function. It might not have an, uh, it might be like a function with no argument, but empty list doesn't make sense here. So that's what we're doing here. We get the first element, run the analyze in it, and get the uh, value after semantic analysis uh, did his job. Why we do, uh, why, why do we want to analyze the first argument? That's because we, so we have different types of uh, function calls, right? The simplest one is like this. We call the function HNT, that's it, no argument, right? Another type is something like this. We call uh, anonymous function, we define an anonymous function, and then we call it with some arguments, right? So since the FN node itself returns an anonymous function, so that we can call it in place immediately. That's another type. Or we have some other types like, I don't know, uh, if we do a def, def should return the binding. So when, when we define a binding, uh, when we define a binding, basically what happens is the return value of this def has to be the binding. Binding refers to a function, so we should be able to call it, right? So since we have different types of uh, function calls, we want to analyze the first argument to make sure that like we know what's going on. If the return value wasn't uh, there, if it was a, like an errorful case, a failure case, we just return the failed value, simple. But if it was a success case, then we get the value and if the value was ne uh, null, sorry, we don't need to rewrite, so we put it back. It should be uh, the first element. So it happens when the first element is a symbol or a number, right? So we don't rewrite it, we just put it back. But as you can see, we didn't, we put it back by setting the first value, the first variable to that element. We have to do some other stuff. So we create a target node, uh, raw parameters, and then we check for the number of uh, elements we have. So do we have uh, arguments for this function call or not? If you remember from previous episode, from is basically like create a new uh, list for me from the first ep episode, first sorry, element of this list till the end. So the raw parameters will will be every element beside the first, but first, you know. And then we look for the type of that first element. If it was a symbol, easy peasy, it should be, uh, we should look it up in the scope and then call, uh, create a function call for that. So we dynamically cast it to a symbol. If it wasn't a symbol, just fail, make the linter happy. Otherwise, again, I'm not going to talk about the namespace stuff here. What, what we're doing here is to look into the current scope to find that binding, to find the function with that name, with the name inside the sim variable. If it was there, if it wasn't there, sorry, we return a new, mess a new error message saying that we can't resolve the symbol blah blah being like the name of the symbol we're trying to resolve, right? So what happens here is basically we there's no such binding in our scope anywhere. So there must be a mistake and we return that error. Otherwise, if we found that binding, we get the value, put it in the target node. But if the type of the uh, first element was uh, is def or call or function, we just use the same thing as the 
target node because the rule the same rule applies to all three right so in case of def def has to return a new binding so if the new binding uh, would be our target the call itself means that we want to run we want to call the return value of a function call so that call itself would be the target and same goes for fn for a function type otherwise if, if it wasn't any of those we just fail the uh semantic analysis thing that like stating that we don't know how to call the first element so if the first element was uh, is a string or we don't have a string yet is a number for example we don't know how to call a number so we fail here and finally we analyze the any possible um parameters that we might have if we don't have any parameter basically it would be fine again because we don't have anything to loop over so everything would be good we won't have any error if we had any er error in our arguments fail the semantic analyzer otherwise create a new node uh, with the name call the given location of the list itself the target node and finally the value of uh, the arguments so here here is the all the things you know, need to know about the uh, these new uh, expression types that we didn't talk about in the previous episode um, in the next episode, we are going to talk about the context, the string context, name spaces, scopes, things like that, that we escaped over this uh, in this episode. Um, I guess it was a, like a long episode. I don't know how long it is, but um, after this episode and probably the next one, uh, we're going to enter the MLIR realm. So some of the stuff that we talked about in the like in this episode is around the semantic analysis and the different node types uh they they're useful to us they make our life much easier to create a new dialect of mlir we're going to see about that in the future but the whole purpose of semantic analysis beside checking for the correctness uh, the semantic uh, co correctness of our program um, is to actually be ready and get ready for mapping our nodes into mlirs uh, basically the slirs serene uh, intermediate representation to map the uh, node types to operations in our uh, SLIR. We're going to see about that uh, in future episodes. Uh, that's it for today, folks. Uh, thank you for sticking around. It, it was a long episode. Hope to see you in the future episode as well. Have a great day and see you in the next episode.